How's everybody? Everyone calm down. A little stressful getting here. Just take a down. Take a breath. It's okay. We're all, we all made it. We, uh, we started a series two weeks ago on heaven. And uh, the idea, if you think about the word heaven or you think about the picture of heaven, what's, what do you visualize when you think about heaven? Just think, just like five seconds. Think about heaven. A lot of us have a really fuzzy picture. Um, there was a Far Side comic, if you remember The Far Side by Gary Larson in the 90s, one of my favorite comics. And he drew a picture of a person just floating on a cloud with a white robe and sandals on and wings and a halo. And the caption read this, man, I wish I brought a magazine. Because in the picture, he wasn't, nobody was around him. He was just floating on a cloud. And the idea is that heaven's gonna be boring. It's not gonna be a party, it's gonna be the worst. And that's a really tragic thing because Jesus talked so often about the city to come. The apostle Paul and Peter, all those that endured martyrdom in their faith, their hope what was, what was to come. And I know that we love the here and now and we should. In fact, Jesus told us that our job today as followers of Jesus is to bring a little bit more of heaven to earth, right? He said, may your kingdom come, may your will be done through our work and our generosity, through our smiles, through the way that we care for people, so that you and I, we care very much about the here and now. But as we're gonna discover week by week in this series, it's so important that it informs how we live today to have a really strong and clear picture of what's to come. And so if you'll imagine this, a coloring book. Okay, so imagine a coloring book. It's got white pages, a little bit of an outline, and there's no colors in it. What this series is designed to do is to help you and me to fill in the details, to fill in the colors of what heaven's going to be like. And as that picture starts to get clearer and clearer and more beautiful, more vibrant, you and I, I believe, will get more hopeful. We can't live without hope. And that's why the city of God and the eternal place that God is preparing a place for us is so, so important. The Apostle Paul said this, set your hearts, to set your mind on what? On things above. I don't know about you, but it is so easy. It's natural to think about things below. I, I opened up our, uh, our lovely statement from the city of Montreal not too long ago, and our taxes went up. Praise God for that, right? You know, it's easy to set our minds on taxes. It's easy to set our minds on our relationship dynamics that may not be well. It's easy to, as moms and dads, you guys are like, man, I'm tired of making lunches. When is school going to be over, right? Or students, you're like, when is school going to be over? I can get out of these books. I can actually burn my kids like to burn their books literally at the end of the year. So I'm not encouraging pyrotechnic stuff, but anyways. But it's easy, isn't it, to set our minds on things below? Easy to keep our head down and focus on our problems. And the Apostle Paul reminds us over and over again to set our minds above. And so that's what this series is designed to do. This is, in my opinion, and a lot of people's opinion, the best book on heaven. A lot of the messages will come from this book. It's a pretty beefy book, as you can see. It's by Randy Elkhorn. So if you're interested in this topic, I'd highly recommend it. Um, it's a tragic thing that in a lot of the theology that is written, you know, Martin Luther, so many of the great theologians of the past, they, they had 30 or 40 volumes like this of different issues, of different doctrines of the faith. And yet many of them had very little to say about heaven. It's interesting, right? Because they wrote about sin, they wrote about creation, they wrote about angels, they wrote about salvation and all the great things about spiritual gifts and the things that are a lot of detail about. But very little is written about heaven. And probably you've not heard very many messages about heaven, so we're trying to solve that all together. Does that sound good? All right. So without further ado, um, many years ago, 21 years ago, Yancy and I got married in uh, Dallas. And we got married on New Year's Eve, so December 31st, 2002. And we decided for our honeymoon that we're gonna go to the Caribbean. So I wanna give some love to the Caribbean right now. Every time I mention a country in City Church, I get in trouble. I'm trying to show love and be, well, well, you know, <laughs> where's Persian people or where's, where's the Dominican Republic? Uh, see, when someone said, you got to mention the Dominican Republic. There's 192 nations in the world. Okay, so I'm going to probably skip a couple. Colombia. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to share the love. Okay, I'm trying to share the love. St. Vincent. Okay, so that's done. Check. We were in the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands. So we were in the Caribbean. And that's a good place to be in January. Amen? Yeah. 
We should go there sometime. Let's make a trip together in January. We'll go to Jerusalem one time, and another time we'll go to the Caribbean. We'll do both. And uh, man, the beautiful place, beautiful view, beautiful people, beautiful weather, and something that I had not done before, snorkeling. How many people have ever snorkeled before? Now, it's not a very attractive thing to do when you're on your honeymoon. Like, you look really weird with a mask on and a big thing. You know, that's not, it's not the you know, most attractive thing, but it is amazing if you've ever been snorkeling in a place where there's really clear water in the ocean. And I've always loved swimming. I don't know about you, but I've always loved swimming. But having the gift of a mask and a snorkel, you know what it did for me? It opened up a whole new world that was already there. It's this beautiful whole ecosystem, the coral and the colors. I had never seen fish like this before. Like my mom's got a place in Quebec on a lake. We've got fish, we've got bass, right? We've got pike, we've got perch. Nothing like these kind of fish, like unbelievable. And you know, our lake is kind of gross. It's got seaweed and stuff like this, but there you can see to the bottom in the US Virgin Islands and you can see the beautiful orange of the coral and the pinks and the blues and the yellows. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And here's the fascinating thing. That whole ecosystem was always there, but because I didn't have my mask on, I couldn't see it. And, and what I wanna do today in this message and what this series is designed to do is I wanna be your mask, as it were. I wanna help you point you to what the word of God says about heaven because it's a place that is there. It is a place that is very real and more beautiful than you can ever imagine. But if we don't have our mask on, we will miss out on some of those details and that hope that Jesus talked about and the Apostle Paul and Peter wrote about so often, we will miss that hope and it will greatly impoverish our life today. And so that's why we're spending so much time thinking about heaven. And so if you have your Bible today, we're gonna hop around a little bit. Uh, we're gonna start in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, we're gonna be in verses eight to 10 and then skip over to chapter 13. So what I'd like to do, if I could, could I be a tour guide today? So heaven is like this. Heaven is like dot, dot, dot. The first thing that we're going to see is heaven is like a city. Heaven is like a city. The Bible describes heaven as a city. Do we know what a city looks like? Yeah, we live in a pretty awesome one, wouldn't you say? Montreal is an amazing city. Heaven is described, not shockingly, as a city because all of us live in a city. So Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham when he was called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Look at verse 10 with me. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Now flip over to chapter 13, verse 14, Hebrews 13, verse 14. The same author says this, for we do not have an enduring city. Montreal is not an enduring city. London, Tokyo, all these cities are not enduring cities, but we are looking for what? The city that is to come. You know what's fascinating? If you read, if you have some time this afternoon, go into a, a, uh, Hebrews 11 because a lot of people call it the Hall of Fame faith. So if you're into sports, you know, there's a Hall of Fame for basketball and football and hockey and it's kind of cool to visit all those the legends of the sports. In the same way, Hebrews 11 has these great uh, people of faith, men and women who did incredible things. You know what's in common for all of them? None of them got what they wanted. None of them got exactly the picture, the dream that God had entrusted to them. None of them, including Abraham, actually received what was promised to him. But what they did is they fixed their eyes on what was to come. And the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews clarifies that for us. He says well, what they were actually looking forward to was not a temporary city, but it was an enduring city whose architect and builder is none other than God himself. That's pretty amazing, right? that God is an architect, he's a builder, he's constructing a city for us. So what is heaven like? First of all, it's a city. We all know what cities look like. Um, I got some pictures that I just pulled off my iPhone. A couple of the pictures were a friend of mine, Mark, went to uh, my neighbor from two doors down. He just went to the Grand Canyon. 
Now, if you and I scrolled through our Android dev devices, our iPhones, you and I could pull up some incredible pictures and just do some airplay, right, and share these pictures. We would be like, ooh, ah, amazing, right? This is, I didn't spend hours. I spent like literally five minutes. I just want to show you some of the beauty of this world, okay? Some of the beauty of the cities of this world. And so, first picture, look at that. That, my friends, is the Grand Canyon. Look at the beauty of the colors. Look at the beauty of the textures. The next slide has a, another view of a similar area in the Grand Canyon. Look at that river that snakes. I think it's the Colorado River that snakes through those canyons. Just the beauty. Again, if you and I could compare vacation pictures, you and I could compare places that we've been that are just would take your breath away. These are just pictures of Earth today. Next picture, please. One of my favorite things to do is going skiing. I don't get to do it a lot as a hockey coach, unfortunately, but one of my favorite things to do is, you know, the last 10 seconds when you get off the chairlift, that's stressful. But before you get there, like the 30 seconds before that, when you get to near the top, what happens? Your, your soul usually exhales a little bit because it's quiet. And you can look around and you can just see from a different vantage point. In Tromblon, this is at Tromblon, 4,000 feet above sea level. And it's quiet and it's peaceful and it's so majestic in the snow. Even though some of us get tired of snow, isn't snow beautiful? Next picture. This is what it looks like in the summer, that very same vantage point. Just from a little, again, an amateur photographer, right? iPhone picture. This is just a little bit of the beauty. Look at that. The same vantage point, all the trees and the grass and the stones looking over that same body of water with the clouds and the sky. It's such a beautiful place. And then down below at the river, I got a picture of uh, one of my favorite things to do is just sit by the water. Don't you love that? I think all of our anxiety is just going down right now. It's like, whew, I made it. I might have had to walk to get here, but I made it, right? Whew. There's something beautiful about sitting by the water. Just the, the waves kind of lapping against the sea or the lapping against the dock. There's something just very, very, it does, it does something for our, our, our peace and our, our souls. It's so beautiful. And so one of the ways that God helps us to get excited about the city that is to come is that he says that heaven is like a city. And you and I have been to places that are more beautiful than really words can describe. And that gives us a little glimpse and a picture of what it's going to be like. The same colors, the same textures, the same stones, the same mountains, the same snow, the same oceans, the same salt water are going to be for us to enjoy. Okay. Revelation chapter 21, if you have your Bible, just skip over to that. Revelation 21, I want to give you an idea of the capital city. Maybe you've not thought about this, but we're going to travel in heaven. And the capital city where God is said to dwell with us, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, that Jesus is actually preparing a place for us. Revelation chapter 21 verses 15 and 16 describes a little bit of the dimensions of this city, the capital city. The angel who talked with me, had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and as high as it is long. And so there's a lot of detail in there. First of all, what a stadia is, it's been a long time since I've used stadia as a measurement, probably you too, right? That's an ancient measurement, but 12, what was it? 12,000 stadia converts to 2,200 kilometers. Okay? So imagine a capital city that's 2,200 kilometers long. Imagine a city that's 2,200 kilometers wide. And imagine a city that's 2,200 kilometers up in the sky. Now, that's a cube. And some people say, well, this is just a... Uh, this is just the Bible's way of giving us a, a spiritual idea of how great heaven's going to be like. But you know what was actually a cube in the Word of God and a place that God had architects build? The Holy of Holies was a cube. The place where God was seen to dwell within the temple that Solomon built and later the Hezekiah temple, it was preserved as a Holy of Holies. And that room was 30 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 30 feet high. So wouldn't it make sense that the place where God is going to dwell, there would also be a cube? Now, we don't know if this means like the, the spire goes to the 2,200 kilometers up like a, the CN Tower does, like not everybody lives that high. 
We don't know if we'll have different lungs or the atmosphere will be different, but it describes a cube. And now a lot of you are thinking like, how, how long is 2,200 kilometers? So can I help you with that? I did a little bit of research. Okay, so picture we're leaving, we're going on a trip today to go to Miami, Florida. That's 2,200 kilometers south of Montreal. Okay, so just we had to go over the ocean to get there. We're, we're not going like, we're going like directly through the air. So 2,200 kilometers south from Montreal to Miami is how long the city will be. Not the country, just the city. Okay, now we have to use all of North America, by the way, for these dimensions. We've got to go into Mexico as we go west. We're going to go across the Gulf of Mexico into Monterey, Mexico. Any Mexicans? No, okay. Anyways, we're into Monterey, Mexico. That's 2,200, 2200 kilometers from Miami to Monterey, Mexico. Now we've got to go back north again to complete the cube. We're going to go to Omaha, Nebraska. Nobody knows where that is. It's below Winnipeg, kind of ish. Okay, so it's that far up from Monterey, Mexico, all the way to Omaha, uh, Nebraska. Now it's an imperfect, you know, it's an imperfect map, obviously, but to complete the 2,200 kilometers now east, we have to go all the way to Quebec City. So from Omaha, Nebraska to Quebec City is 2,200 kilometers east. Just for a sense of scale, this heaven is described, the city of God is described as 40 times bigger than the city of London. It's big. It's 10 times bigger than the whole country of France, 10 times bigger than the country of Germany. And we know it's just a city because it's described as having gates at the north end, at the east end, at the south end, and at the west end. There's three gates at each one of those entrances, which tells us we are going to come and go in the city of God. What are we going to do? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm a pretty good tour guide, right? Um, let me give you, uh, I use some uh, artificial intelligence for this. I have some of my, uh, James is on the second row. He told me a little bit about this program called uh, Microsoft Copilot. So I just typed in some stuff. I hope you'll enjoy this. We have a hard time visualizing heaven, don't we? So let's just use the, the power of imagination here together. So this is what the city of Montreal, I typed in Montreal as heaven, what it could look like. And this is what it popped up. Look at that. That's the, that's the, that's the St. Lawrence River. Uh, I don't think I would swim in it right now. But, but I would swim in this river. What about you? Look at the mountains in the background. Wouldn't that be cool? Now, this is a very small city compared to what we just described, but this gives us a, it's, it just kind of piques our imagination. We're going to have mountains and oceans, right? We're going to have culture. We're going to eat. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have all the peoples of the world in the city of God together. Some other pictures that it could look like with bridges and water, with the, with the water, the river of life in the city of God. So let's go to the next picture, please. Look at that. Just the beautiful, beautiful parts of, of the sun and the moon and the clouds and the skyscrapers and the gardens. There's going to be all of that. Everything that we love about cities will be part of the city of God. Everything that you've enjoyed about a city that you love, part of that will be in the city of God. Look at that one. Kind of looks like a little futuristic Manhattan kind of, right? Look at the boats in the middle. How cool is that? The river of life throwing through the city, right? skyscrapers, but also natural beauty. I think that's what it's going to be like. It's going to be the, the beauty and the sophistication of architects and builders and precious stones, but also the natural beauty of clouds and mountains and oceans and rivers. Okay. Look at that. That looks awesome. Anyway, just to, just to whet our appetites a little bit, because again, the last thing that you and I want to do is to have harps and listen to worship music 24 seven. Apologies to our worship team. I love worship, but not, you know, for a little bit of time. I don't want to do that 24-7 with, a, you know, wings. That's not my picture of, of heaven. So it, what city, what, what God describes heaven like, it's a city. It's a vast city. It's a capital city where we're going to explore. We're going to see all the beautiful things that we've enjoyed. And the best part of the city is this next part, Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. This will get you excited if you're not excited already. Revelation 21, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. Now picture somebody with a really deep voice, okay? I don't want to scare you. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. The best feature of the city of God, the best feature of heaven is that God himself will be there. 
that God's going to have a residence. He'll have an address where you and I can go knock on his door. We're going to see the fingerprints of Jesus where he was scarred, right? His feet were scarred. That's going to be a permanent part of his physical being, that we're going to be able to see Jesus, talk to Jesus, interact with Jesus. In the same way that we'll have a physical dwelling place, Jesus will have a dwelling place. In the same way that Adam and Eve had the pleasure, the privilege of walking with God in the cool of the garden, you and I will recover that benefit. He will be our God and we will be his kids. We're going to have the privilege of being with him in that same magical, majestic city. God himself will be there. If that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what could. Some of us, again, we, we think about floating on clouds or singing worship music for a little bit of time, but that, that gets a little bit stale. Um, I don't know if this will excite you or make you upset, but we're going to work in heaven. We're going to create and cultivate in heaven. How do I know this? Because a lot of it is the parallel of how God has made us, and he's made us to create. He's made us to expand. He's made us to be cultivators. What he said to Adam and Eve is to have dominion, exercise authority, to fill and subdue the earth, to build cities, to architect, to engineer things, to make livable and great structures for the world and for culture to come to life. And so part of the city of God is that we're going to work, we're going to rest. I, at the end of the day, is there anything more satisfying than putting your feet up with a cold beverage? especially this time of year, right? You get outside, maybe you're working on your garden. And once you get the weeds out, which takes way longer than it should, right? You water it. And man, you kind of admire your work. Part of why we don't like work is because of the, the curse of sin, the weeds that emerge from sin, right? That our productivity is marred because of the, the sin that's entered our world. And not just that, but we have a, embedded within workplaces and cultures and companies, there's work that exploits people, doesn't pay them a, a livable wage, or maybe your boss is just not kind to you. God's going to recover and redeem all of that. He's going to give us meaningful work, giving us opportunities to create and cultivate and expand and have adventures, and then also give the gift of rest. One of my favorite parts of my study this week is this next part. So we're going to, we talked about God giving us a city, the size of the city, the dimensions of the city. God himself is in the city. Talked a little bit about some of the activities. We're going to work. We're going to rest. We're going to Sabbath, right? But also, here's one of the most exciting parts. The, the features of arts and culture, the best parts of our world today will show up in the city of God. And living in a city like Montreal, where culture and the arts are celebrated, and where there's so much diversity, that excites me. Because when I've lived in other places where it's kind of like one or two people groups, you know, you, you, you go over to people's house and it's always the same food, right? It's always kind of the same routine. Coming to Montreal, I never know what's going to get served to me. And I love that. It could be adobo, right? It could be shawarma. It could be a Brazilian barbecue. It could be plantains. It could be Jamaican beef patties. I don't leave anybody out, right? So, but it's, let's just read what Isaiah says, because, you know, we think that the only thing about heaven is in Revelation, but actually it's in Isaiah, it's in Ezekiel, it's in Jesus' gospels, it's in the Apostle Paul's writings. The, the pictures of heaven are all through the scriptures. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 5 says, the wealth on the seas will be brought to you. The riches of the nations will come. Your, your gates will always stand open. They will never be shut day or night so that people may bring you the wealth of the nations. Their kings led in triumphal procession. For the nation or kingdom that will not serve you will perish. It will be utterly ruined. So what God's saying is that some of the greatest works of art that you have seen. Have you ever gone to an art museum before? Have you ever seen a great sculpture or a great painting or perhaps a great tapestry, maybe clothing. And you just marvel at, man, I wish I could do that. I wish I could sing like Yancey or Zoe, right? I wish I could play drums. I wish I could play guitar like Arthur. I wish I could, I wish I could put these things together. I could take a slab of marble and make the David. And what this verse is saying is that God is going to take the very best creations of mankind through all time, and, and the kings of the earth are going to bring them into the city of God. 
and all the wealth, so all the, the precious metals, all of the greatest resources will come into the city of God. And it says that God's going to allow the kings to bring their own treasures from their own countries, their own cultures, African treasures and Asian treasures and North American treasures and European treasures from all different periods of history will show up in the city of God. So if you love music, if you love paintings, if you love sculptures, it's going to show up in the city of God. That God's going to allow the kings of the earth, the, the powerful rulers of all different generations from all different tribes of the world, and they themselves are going to bring their people's greatest artifacts and bring them into the city of God. Is that awesome? Yancy and I, when we were uh, just married, we got a really cheap ticket to go to Europe. And back in those days, when I was in my mid-20s, I didn't mind backpacking, right? So we were staying with a bunch of people in a room. It wasn't romantic, but it was like, it was cheap. You know, so we got to do a lot of things in Europe that we probably we couldn't afford today, quite honestly. And so we got to Paris and we went to the Le Louvre, right? And have you ever been to a Le Louvre, the Louvre? It's unbelievable. It's got art from like 2,000 years ago. It's or even beyond that from all the cultures of the world. The Mona Lisa was there, or I think in French it's known as Le Joconde, right? And honestly, I wasn't that impressed with that one, but that's okay. Um, but there was other works of art that were just unbelievable, tapestries and sculptures and paintings from, again, all the cultures of the world. And we went to Florence in Italy, and we, we saw the David. We just came around this corner, and it was like, it was like the sunlight was coming in from the skylight. It was like, oh! And like all the men are like, kind of like hiding themselves because the David looks, he's, like, he's, he's built up, right? And all the women are like, wow, I wish my husband looked like that. But, and I'm, not, I'm no art historian. Like, some of you are really into art. Some of you are really into music. Some of you are really into culture. But I think all of us appreciate it. Heaven's not going to be bland. Heaven's going to be filled with the greatest works of art, the greatest act of cultivation and work and culture. People like if we went to the Sistine Chapel, for example, in Vatican City in Rome, when we walked into the room, Yancy and I, they said to us, if you can help it, please don't breathe in the Sistine Chapel. I'm like, What? <laughs> Like they literally said that to us because, you know, if you breathe and the, the carbon dioxide is going to start chipping the paint off the ceiling. I'm like, I understand it's a precious work of art, but I'm not a synchronized swimmer. You know what I mean? So, um, but there's some things that I saw, including the Sistine Chapel. It takes your breath away. And so why wouldn't God take that precious work of art that took years and years painstakingly painting on his back? He had back problems for the rest of his life painting the Sistine Chapel. Why wouldn't God import those works of art and bring them as wealth into the city of God? So you're starting to get a picture. It's the dimensions of the city, the vibrancy of the city, the favorite things that you've seen and heard and experienced and tasted. The music and the art, all the cultures of all the places of the earth will be brought into the city of God. And then finally, what are we going to do? We're going to eat. We're going to drink. Think about the best meal you've ever had. A lot of times it's on a vacation because we save up our money for 11 and a half months or 11 and three quarter months, right? And we blow it all in a week, right? We, we fly somewhere. We have a beautiful location. We have a sunset. We're with our loved ones. We're with our family members. We're like, whoa, I'm not going to look at the, the amount of this bill cost me, right? But isn't there something special about an incredible meal with your most loved people, maybe your spouse, maybe your kids, maybe not your kids, maybe your friends, right? And, and the best thing that you've tasted is with the people that you love. It's oftentimes in a very beautiful place. And that's a little picture of that hankering that you and I have for heaven. The best time for that is usually day two or three or four of your vacation. The last day of vacation, what are you thinking about? You're sad, you're depressed because you're going back to reality where you're going to have porridge and cereal again. You're not going to have this beautiful location. You're not going to be on the U.S. Virgin Islands anymore. You're going to go back to, you know, the middle of Texas or whatever. So, but quite honestly, why we get excited for a vacation and why we get depressed a little bit at least when we're leaving our vacation is because we're not meant for this world. That the beauty that we enjoy the appreciation of drink and food and textures, the appreciation of art, the appreciation of different cultures and places that you've traveled to are just a foretaste of what God is creating for us to enjoy. So as we go week by week in this series, I hope that we're just whetting your appetite. We're, again, 
taking that that color brush and we're just painting the colors into this blank canvas and helping you to get excited for the place that God is creating for us to enjoy. I want to conclude. I want to invite our worship team to come forward. We're going to sing a couple of songs of response in communion. But when we take these communion elements, by the way, if you don't have one of these, we have some baskets at the front in case. Maybe we can get some people to pass them around, if you don't mind. Can I get a volunteer? Thank you. Just raise your hand if you don't have them. But when we think about communion, a lot of times, and rightly so, we, fit, we focus on the past. We focus on what Jesus went through in the hours before his death. We think about the cross. But actually what Jesus said in the last moments with his disciples, he not only talked about what was going to happen in the hours before his death, but he also talked about what was going to happen in the future. So I want to read that for you because hopefully from now on, when you take communion, it will remind you that we have something to look forward to something tangible. And this is what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 to 29. And then Jesus, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now let's look into this last part here. Verse 29, Jesus said, I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. What Jesus is saying is that even as I'm having this meal with you, my 11 disciples, now by this point, Judas has already left on his way to betray Jesus. And now it's 11 and the room is heavy with it's foreboding, right? It's a heavy room. It's like, who's going to, who's, what's happening? Why, why is my rabbi? Why is my savior? Why is my, my Jesus talking about death? And so he's talking about what's going to happen in the hours after that. So he's going to be persecuted. He's going to be executed for being the savior of Israel. I mean, what Jesus says in that moment is, as you drink this wine, know this. I will not drink wine until the day that I come back and drink it anew with everybody in the new kingdom of God. So even as we look back at the cross, we look back at our salvation that Jesus was a real man. He was a real man who was executed by a real government on a real place on Golgotha outside of Jerusalem. Jesus is also saying though that I also want you to think about what's coming and there's joy coming one day that he's going to eat and drink with us in the very city of God. So I want to pray for us as we can contemplate the sacrifice of Jesus that makes all of this possible. Right before his death, Jesus gave comfort to his disciples saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And what my death will mean is that it'll mean salvation. It'll mean freedom. It will mean that you'll not have to carry around shame and guilt anymore, but you'll also have a place with me, this beautiful place that we've described forever in the city of God with me. So Father, would you encourage us this morning? Father, today we put the spotlight where it, where it deserves to be back on the face of Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for giving your very life for me for us. Thank you for dying the death that I deserve to die. Thank you for coming into this world that did not receive you. This world that was hostile to you, this world that executed you so that you could make me your son and make you a daughter. So Jesus, as we reflect, as we think about the, the bread to symbolize your body that was broken and to drink to symbolize the blood that was spilled. I pray that we would worship you and I pray that we would leave here changed for these next seven days, reminding ourselves that we have freedom and we have the opportunity to bring more of heaven to our city. So Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. Prepare our hearts right now to receive communion, to be united together as a family and to proclaim that you're coming back soon. In Jesus' name, amen.